There's a uh, great character in the Harry Potter series named Hermione Granger. And uh, Hermione is this studious, smart, bookish person who's always about 80 chapters ahead of the rest of the students. And she can't wait for there to be a test. And uh, the teacher would say, we have a test tomorrow. And the whole class would groan. And Hermione would be, yes! And uh, I don't know about you, um, but I'm guessing we all know people who loved tests. I don't know. Show of hands. How many of you love test day? Pa- Bev did. Uh, I was definitely not one of those people who liked tests. I was one of the people who groaned. I was one of those people who was always, always wishing that my school would adopt a no testing philosophy because I always dreamed of a world without tests. But I, I know how, how naive how unrealistic and impossible that is because testing is always a part of life and it's always an important part of life. Some tests and quizzes are utterly ridiculous and I'll say some are stupid and nonsensical like the ones people take on Facebook to determine which Downton Abbey character or which Smurf personality you possess. But many, many tests in life truly do matter. And today I want you to just say fundamentally, what is a test? And there's a variety of things that a test is. But first, you might think of a series of questions or exercises that you are asked to do that measure a skill or your intelligence or an aptitude in a certain area. Uh, As a kid, I remember you uh, had had to do a proof to test how well you could do geometry. Or you, uh, in certain cases, you had to see what facts you could recall as part of a history exam. But even in our professional life, people have to take tests to be able to to carry certain licenses or be able to perform certain jobs. They have to have a certain level of aptitude. A test is also a critical exam to see if something is running well. And the purpose of that is if, if something needs to change, you can make a course correction. Uh, you know, we take our cars in for that purpose, because if, if something's not running well, you try and fix it right then and there, so you can uh, make sure it lasts longer. It's good stewardship. You realize you do that to your own physical body. You, uh, you go to the doctor occasionally. Maybe it's to measure your uh, eyesight, or your heart, or uh, in my case recently, I had to do a sleep study and realized I needed a CPAP, so uh, hopefully that will give me some longevity over the long haul, but without that test, course correction could not have happened. In sports, you know, you realize game day or race day really isn't what it's all about. That's really just a a way to measure how your training over a longer period of time has been. It's a piece of cake on race day if you've done the discipline of daily, daily runs. Uh, Testing is also something we do. It's an act. It's an action. You realize you uh, sometimes take a car out uh, to see if you like it, or you try on clothes or shoes, or people visit a community to see if that's a place they want to live. And if we're honest, we recognize people come into the doors of a church to to test us out, to see if uh, this is a friendly place, or they're welcome here, or they can envision being a part of the mission in a place. What I say tonight as we begin Lent, though, is I think we test what we value. And certainly God tests what God values. And testing is not a bad thing. Testing, in many ways, is a wonderful thing. You know, God uh, tests his beloved child and his beloved children to see how they value the relationship, to see if it really matters to them as 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 much as we matter to God. You know, we're tested to see if we truly trust in God and to see how we need to grow. And it's always, in my mind, a test by God is to help us grow stronger in the faith and to to help us focus a bit more. So we begin Lent. Lent is a time really to help us focus, to grow in our faith, and to remember Jesus' story, Jesus the beloved of God. You know, we read pretty much uh, this year from the Gospel of Mark, and it's the earliest gospel, and it's the briefest. And uh, it says in, in, in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus headed down the, to the River Jordan, presumably from his hometown of Nazareth, left there, 
was baptized by John, and there he heard the voice of, of God saying, you are my beloved. You are the agape. You are the unconditional love of my life, is what that is saying. And then it says the Spirit cast him out into the wilderness, into the Eremos, for 40 days, where he was tested. Even though it, it read in English, tempted, in the Greek it means he was tested. And it's the longest test that I, I've, the longest test I ever took was the SAT. Uh, and that was probably six hours of torture. This is 40 days. 40 days of being tested by an adversary. And we, Mark really, when you really think about it, and a lot of you know the other, the other Gospels, but if we simply focus on what Mark says, Mark doesn't give us much to go on. He simply implies that out in that wilderness, there were forces at work trying to get Jesus to lose focus, to lose discipline, to lose sight of that relationship with God, and really to keep him from taking steps forward in the faith in fulfilling the mission that God had called him to do. There's no dialogue, absolutely no dialogue in what I read tonight. There's no quote by Jesus. There's no quote by Satan, the adversary. It just simply says Jesus experienced this long, long test in the wilderness, and he passed, and he would not be derailed from what God was calling him to be. But I think the one thing you need to remember, and I, I think it's the, the, the gem of what Mark is saying here, uh, Mark says he was in the will, the, uh, all throughout this experience, God's angels or God's messengers were ministering to Jesus daily. In the Greek, that's what it's saying is continuously there was God sending help to Jesus to help him through this test. And, uh, you know, I think that would be very, very important for us to remember as we think about the wilderness experiences of our life. When we use that phrase, wilderness, we often think of a tough time or where we're tested or where life is difficult, where sometimes we may lose focus, sometimes we may feel like we're alone. Like Jesus, what, what, what this text is saying is God will continually send help into your life hidden messengers to, uh, to bless us, to keep us going and keep us stepping out in the faith. We often will use that phrase, you're a godsend, you're a godsend. And I think in this season of Lent, it's, it's our call to pay more attention to the little, little simple things in life where we're, we're blessed with encouragement or a kind word or someone goes out of their way to help us. Because what this text is saying is it's going to be continually a part of of your daily journey if you just open your heart and your mind to that. I was at a conference once, and uh, Robert Wicks, who's a, a spirit pastoral counselor up at uh, Loyola University, uh, he challenged a group of pastors uh, to spend two minutes a day in silence and solitude and wrapped in gratitude. And uh, I remember the whole group of people looked at him like he was nuts, that shouldn't clergy be praying more than two minutes a day? And uh, the reality is, a lot of times, even in, the, even in uh, two moments, we get distracted, start looking at the cell phone or thinking about a to-do list. If we could, each of us, have one single, uh, every single day, just spend just a, a, a moment or two of, of absolutely nothing else getting in the way and simply saying, God, help me. Help me, help me to see the ways in which you are blessing my life and helping me through life's difficulties. Because the more you realize that God is there to help you, the more you can be a help to someone else and a godsend in their life. Amen.